This is Startup Storefront. Pisco is the best kind of brandy that I bet you've never heard of. It all starts in the vineyards in Peru. The grapes are picked, pressed, and fermented to create this delicious spirit. Peruvian Pisco is so pure that not even one drop of water will ever touch the inside of the bottle. The liquor is never cut with sulfates or additives, and let me tell you, you can definitely taste the quality. In this episode, we talk with Alex Hildebrand, co-founder of Soyo Pisco, about using the playbook that tequila and mascal brands created and the feud between Peru and Chile over Pisco. And thank you to Cat Footwear for sponsoring this episode. They're a premier shoe company that empowers builders and doers to reframe the world to create something more meaningful. Get ready. You're about to discover the world of single origin Pisco. All right. Welcome to the podcast on today's show. We're talking to Alex from Suyo Pisco. Thanks for joining us. People don't know. What does your company do? Thanks for having me. So Suyo Pisco is a brand of Pisco, which is a spirit that uh, is relatively unknown today, particularly in the U.S., but it's a spirit that comes from Peru, and it's a denomination of origin spirit. So if you think tequila, cognac, champagne, that type of thing. And uh, we, we launched the brand recently, and uh, we're here trying to uh, introduce Americans to it so we can help grow the category together. I love it. First of all, first time having two Peruvians on the podcast. What's good? <laughs> Let's go. Epic. Respect. Yeah. And we're drinking, which is even better. Yeah. And so made what it. made you want to start the company? What was the thing where you were like, all right, cool, there's a market opportunity. So I look at this category as like, Pisco is just unknown thing. We all know tequila is taking off. We know Mezcal is like following suit. And so there's a, there's a bit of change happening, let's call it, in the alcohol spirits space. What makes you want to quit everything you're doing and then go ahead and like forge a path into this unknown and try to bring, you know, a whole new category to the market? So what's happened with the tequila category that you reference is a, is a really good comp and even more recently Mezcal. Our inspiration, and when I say our, it's myself and my business partner, Ian, who uh, was a friend of mine for several years. And uh, as a recently a business partner, we started this venture together. Neither one of us came from this space. So we came from, from completely different worlds. And we always kind of had this dream to, and we talked about it for, for many years, about how we can sort of build a bridge between our home country of Peru and the U.S. And there are a lot of products that come to mind when you think of how to do this. You have some really, really great products like, like quinoa, like potatoes, avocados, things that are asparagus that are native to Peru that foreigners have kind of come and found in Peru, which is the most, I think by definition, biodiverse country in the world. So we have these really amazing products, but we haven't commercialized them well. They've had a lot of success outside of Peru, but it's been non-Peruvian sort of doing it. We want to show that we as Peruvians have something that we are very passionate about and we want to make it successful globally and, and sort of get the credit for it too as Peruvians. So we were tossing around ideas for, for years when we were still working our, our corporate jobs. And uh, truthfully, it sort of just hit us one day. I was down visiting my family. Most of my family still lives in Peru and uh, Ian had moved back to Lima already. We were sitting uh, out on a, on a patio in, in Lima, uh, which is the capital city where we're both from. And it seemed like the idea kind of smacked us in the face as we were drinking uh, Capitanes, which is uh, what Diego is drinking drinking right right now. now. People are listening, delicious. And we thought, well, what about Pisco? We've we've been drinking this our our adult entire adult lives, and really before that, Uh, why has this not really gotten to the level of popularity outside of Peru that it has within? And it was kind of this this head scratcher that we couldn't seem to wrap our arms around. So we started doing a little bit of digging, and uh, while we were familiar with Pisco, as I'm sure you are, Diego, or I know you are, Diego, just from having grown up drinking it, we didn't really know everything we needed to know, particularly coming from outside the category. So we wanted to learn as much as possible. We got in his car the next day and took a trip down to one of the more kind of commercial distilleries south of Lima. And there was just so much that we absorbed in that day that we figured we have to, we have to learn everything now. So I was actually flying back to the U.S. the next day, which is where I, I live now. And thankfully, this all happened right before the pandemic struck. So I was able to fly over the course of about six months or just before the pandemic, I flew about six times, basically once a month. So he and I could get in his his car and, and meet as many producers and vineyards and families as possible so we could figure out what's the best way to do this. And what we discovered was, so if you go to about three hours south of Lima is, is called Ica and just north of that is the port of Pisco where the name came from, the name of the spirit. That's kind of the epicenter of Pisco production. But if you drive an hour north or east or south, you have these amazing producers who don't have the opportunity to make it to the epicenter of production to get sort of that exposure that can can help them. Oh, is it smaller batches too? 
Totally. Is that, okay. Cool. Yeah. So mm-hmm. because they haven't had that sort of commercial success, and these are family run, yeah. really family run operations. A lot of times they're not even looking truthfully for, for that commercial success, but we found that they're making the best Pisco. So we thought, how can we partner with them to make it three hours north to the city of Lima, let alone, you know, globally, because ultimately that's, that's what our goal is. So if you think about Mezcal, you referenced tequila to a lesser extent, they've done such a really good job of, of highlighting the faces behind the production, the origin, where it comes from and what it's made from agave. So what we're trying to do is really draw a parallel path to that. So how can we focus on the producers who are the lifeblood of our business and create a platform for them to really make it outside of their local region? So what we do on the on every single one of our labels is show, again, a la Mezcal, who's done an exceptional job of doing this, showing a map of where it comes from, the name of the producer, the name of the family, the altitude, the annual rainfall, uh, the soil content, because it's a very terroir-driven spirit. So if you're familiar with wine, this is something that's... Uh, you know, probably something you, you know a lot about, but in the spirits category, it doesn't really get that much exposure. There isn't a spirit out there where the terroir of where it's coming from is more important than with Bisco. So our goal is to try to highlight that to people who are being exposed to it so that you can understand, and we'll try some in a little bit, the nuances from batch to batch, region to region, mm-hmm. year to year, because... Just like wine. Exactly. Your product yeah. is dependent yeah. on the harvest. Yeah. When you think about this company, though, so the challenge is... Like the way I, I break it down is you have known successes, right? And so you have a bunch of alcohol that has already made it and they've won tequila, mezcal. You can point to them all day and it's like, all right, cool. They won and this is the playbook. And so the playbook is kind of known and you can even go back as like, like whiskeys all have a playbook. The interesting part is like how you think about this and how you decide to go market in, in a category that is already, you're at a bar, there's limited options, there's limited space. And so how do you go about penetrating the market and getting people to understand this is the second option to you and then making them like really, really value teaching the customer something new, which, which, which in a, in a game of like, just quick, here's your drink, here's your drink is difficult. It's difficult to make them care. Right. That seems like the whole, the whole hard part. Very much so. How do you do it? How do you do it? Therein lies the challenge. In a sense, what is our biggest challenge I think is, is our greatest opportunity as well. And that's the fact that it's such an unknown category. So you walk into a bar, you ask them or a liquor store, whatever the case may be, you ask them about Pisco and you get these, these blank stares. What, like, what are you talking about? So there's a lot of education required, but at the same time, I think there's the, this intrigue that it's something new and you, you see some light bulbs. That's kind of like, why well, haven't I heard of this? Why aren't people drinking this? So that's one of the many things that keeps me motivated and inspires me every single day other than, you know, obviously there are many different reasons, but you're absolutely right. There's limited mind share. There's minute, uh, limited shelf space, but then why is there shelf space for 25 or 30 different tequilas and, you know, 15 or 20 mezcals? I envision a world where, and it's, it's, it's a long game, no doubt. This isn't something that's going to be, whatever your definition of success is, it's not going to be incredibly commercially successful in the next three, three to five years. Why not? Right. Now, Why it, not? It, Let's it unpack be. that. I, it, it's, it could it's, be. So it's depending on what your definition is. Tequila's growth trajectory was over, over decades, mm-hmm. right? And we're at, we're, we're past the saturation point with tequila. Mezcal was over decades also. And, and that's the, the, the best comp in my opinion, because it's kind of historically or was historically viewed as the drink of the campesinos, right? The, the mezcaleros who are out working in the fields and tequila was the drink of, of choice in the city. Mezcal 15, 20 years ago started growing and then the last 10 years you've seen this insane boom. Pisco is, and, and particularly with like the rigidity or potentially lack thereof of the production methods with, with Mezcal, Pisco has some of the same challenges that you need to adapt a certain type of way to be able to grow. So I, I see Pisco, the opportunity as growing more like a Mezcal rather than a tequila, because the positioning I think should be the same. And that's why we're doing things the way that we do. Um, So I think there is space and look, there's finite amount of shelf space, as you said, but there are places where it can be and should be. I'm not saying who it should be replacing. Yeah. All of it It should replace all All of it. it. When (laughs) you first got into the market, were you doing any research around like, what is the, where does the piece go go? So where does it go from Peru? Where's it going? Who's buying it? What cities, what states, what countries? Or is it like 90% of Pisco is bought in Peru and basically just stored there? Yeah, so interesting fun facts, I guess two facts. Uh, 
yes, the majority of it is uh, remains in Peru. The largest importer of Pisco outside of Peru is, is our neighbors in Chile, who also make their own Pisco. So that's kind of interesting. But they don't have the same regulations that Peruvian Pisco does, is what I read. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So uh, there is Chilean Pisco as well that is uh, a controversial topic for most Peruvians. I have a bit of a non-traditional approach to it because I, I find that we can be more successful educating on the differences than fighting about who who invented it or, you know, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So, uh, yeah, completely different. And I can tell you more about what the main differences are between the two. But because theirs is so different, and I think also they appreciate the quality of ours in Peru, they mm-hmm. import so much of it. The third largest market is the United States of America. Okay. But even still, uh, relative to other spirits that you're probably drinking every single day, it's like a small grain of salt. So when I started researching and I was looking, it's difficult to find good data on this too. Yeah. I saw how small the numbers were of what was being imported and I just, I, I couldn't believe it. So the opportunity is, is vast. Yeah. In the U- U.S. alone, now we want to be global, of course, but the U.S. we feel like is where we need to start to your question on states. Yeah. New York makes a lot of sense because it has a massive mixology scene, very well known. The demographics are right for us. There's a lot of Latinos as well. California, LA, and San Francisco. LA, I think, because of the demographic of the consumer. San Francisco, more because of the cocktail culture. It's a challenge from your part to also get these distributors on board. Like, how much of a challenge is that of getting them to be hype about the product? Distribution is, if not first, probably the second largest challenge that any, I think, any New Spirits brand is going to encounter. Mm-hmm. Because, as you may know, every single state in the US has different laws. So you can't find one catch-all solution. You can't find one distributor that's going to get you into all 50 states. Mm -hmm. So you have to sort of approach each. Hopefully you can work with a distributor who's regional and is in many states, but in many times you're having to work with a different distributor in every single state. So it's a different sales pitch to each distributor. And each distributor has different resources in terms of, you know, what's the knowledge base of my sales reps? Can they take on this thing that is a niche category right now? They're going to have to spend a lot of time educating so you want to align yourself, and we've so far aligned ourselves with uh, distribution partners who, who feel like they get it. And interestingly, it seems like they have a strong focus in wine, which I think is helpful for them because they understand the production methods. Yeah. As such, can educate the, the end accounts, which is the Do you educate them? Like, do you spend time? So what, what kind of things are you doing to make sure that they understand fully what you're trying to achieve? We do. So... We're still pretty early in yeah. the game, so we haven't had a chance to do as much education with the distributors as we would like. But it starts off with with a call with everyone in the market. That we're, so California, for instance, we just started selling in California last month. And the month before that, we had a call with every single sales rep in California with our distributor, spent an hour with them telling them about who we are, what we do, what is the Pisco category in general, and then what makes us unique within that Pisco category. And then we provide materials also so that they can carry around with them. They can hand them out to accounts. They can have sort of cheat sheets as they're talking to to accounts and, and give them little sample bottles. But education is, I mean, absolutely a number one, what probably is the, the, the biggest challenge. That's why I mentioned there's kind of two. It's education and then it's getting distribution. Those Education for us is paramount, though, because we're a relatively unknown category. I took, I took Owen to, there's this group called Sky Duster, and they make beer. And so the beer is like straightforward. Like it's like your Bud Light, your Budweiser, your Heineken. It's like really straightforward, but it's made in L.A. And so it's basically just not big brand, but tastes just like a Sapporo or whatever, all the the classics. And so what I loved about these guys, and it was so fascinating, is that they throw parties for all of their distributors before they even like sign the account. And these parties are basically like swag fest. So they get like all the drinks, the hats, the t-shirts, and it's basically like hype. They're just like, look guys, we want you to have fun with this. You don't have to like the beer. We just want you to have fun selling this into restaurants. And we want, we don't, we're not gonna tell you what we're about. You don't care about me and my story, forget all that. We just want you amped up and like, here are some flavors, here are some drinks, here are some things. Enjoy it, bring your girlfriend, bring all your friends. And it's like a patio party. Next thing you know, these guys are like in every major hotel. And it's just like, it's crazy to me. The fact that they don't even, they really don't educate them at all. They just go, we just want, we want you to like me. That's it. And they play into that game so well and they crush. And it's in-person parties, super fun. And then the whole, dist- and all the sales guys are there. And the sales guys are like, fuck yeah, I can sell this. 
Cause you, and, and in this setting, right, it's a challenge. Like when I saw them do that, all these light bulbs went off for me. I'm like, they're attacking this, not, not from a point of like, let me tell you how I made my beer. And like, we use this hop because it's all that boring science shit. And they were just like, you're a human who probably wants to get laid. Here's a drink. Here you go. And we're cool. Here's a t-shirt. Here's a hat. Here's this. Here's that. And I was like, it was a left for me. I'd never seen anything like that. But the results that I'm watching these guys cr are, are bananas. But like, they can't keep up. And the sales guys love them because it's the first time the sales guy has been loved by a brand in a way that wasn't, uh, sell this, please. Here's a, here's like a, a cheat sheet. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. So you're, you're touching on something that it really I think we do to. it. I think we do it. This is it. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this the, party. is the move. <laughs> yeah. You throw like a little patio party, studio party. Here it is. I got a studio for you. We did something like that in New York. So New York was our first market. And when I tell you that we're relatively new, I, I think of April really as our launch date, April 2022, because that was the first time we had a real distribution partner in New York. But prior to that, we started selling technically in September of 2021, but doing what's considered self-distribution, which is not, it, it's only you're allowed to do in a handful of states. Mm -hmm. So that was really just me running around trying to educate about Pisco. Really four months ago, we started working with a distributor who had all these reps you're referring to who can help us out with that. And then since then, we've rolled out into a handful of other markets with this same group. What we do at Suyo is we think of ourselves as we're not a Pisco brand. We're a, a discovery mission. We are obsessed with this concept of creating experiences for people. So we're not just trying to shove Pisco in your face. We want you to learn about Peru. We want you to learn about our culture. We want you to learn about the experiences that you can get. You don't have to get on a plane to fly to Peru, but maybe it'll cause you to pull up Wikipedia one time and read about something different. We want people to get that experience in a bottle, and it doesn't have to be just between US and Peru. Go learn about something else. Go discover something new. Pisco is Alex and Ian getting into a car and driving and meeting new producers and families a few times a year when I'm down there to meet new Pisco partners. But so I give you that context because how can we give our distributors that same level of experience? What we'd love to do is, is fly every single one of them to Peru and come around with us to all of our vineyards. That's not possible. Right. Right. So how do you incentivize them to do so? A lot of brands create distributor incentives. So the top four or five sales reps will get a, a trip to Mezcal and Tequila have been doing this for years. You get to go visit Oaxaca. You get to go visit Jalisco. We need to start taking people to Peru so they can really see where this is coming from and and love it as much as we do. We need them to get psyched about it. I think it's simpler than that. I think people just want to get laid. I really, I, I say this honestly. Like, I think like, like I hear you, right? I think like, um, I think the problem I, I learned in entrepreneurship is like at the beginning of someone's entrepreneurship journey, usually the, you try to be very clever. You try to be very smart. And then you, what you neglect is like the human condition. The human condition is not that sophisticated. It's basically like food, procreation and survival. Like that's really it. That's really like the three tenets of success. And so if you can tap into one of those as a brand, that's all you need. Also, like flying these people to Peru is a, is a is a muck. You know, it's like they probably don't know the language. How are they going to get there? Who knows? Are they going to have a good time? It's a lot. It's a lot to manage. And I just think like just let that happen on accident. You know, let it let it happen because it will. They're going to get curious on their own, or the right person gets curious on their own. Yeah. So you mentioned the playbook, and there's no cookie cutter approach, but the playbook that I'm referring to has been followed by a lot of these agave spirits. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've heard you talk about Casa Dragones a lot. Legends. Uh, Fortaleza. Uh, I don't know if you've had them. They've done an amazing job over the past decade of just bartenders, press, whomever, come visit our distillery. And they incentivize you to come visit their distillery, learn about us. There's dozens of other brands who have done the same thing. We think that would be helpful to us. Like, of course, we're not going to get everyone there. And maybe that's not the most impactful way. Yeah. People are driven by other incentives, as you mentioned. Suyo is an, really an extension of myself. It's an extension of my business partner. And it's, it's difficult for us to, you know, you talked about the swag and stuff like the, the, the liquor space, the alcohol space in general, it's, it's very much a marketing game. Yeah. Right. You're not satisfying a need. So you agree with that, right though? You agree. With, with which You part? accept that. You accept those rules. Like you accept gravity. You accept, you accept that it's a marketing game. Yes, but it doesn't need to be the heaviest marketing dollars that makes you successful. But I accept that, yes, because you're, you're not, you know, you don't have this widget that's satisfying an immediate need. However, that doesn't mean that there isn't a gap in the market. Everyone's going to be drinking alcohol. It's just a question of what they are drinking. Mm -hmm. Why not give them something that's better? Now, now, what do I mean by better? That's not me just telling you as a brand owner, my product is better. 
This means it's better. We have the only. You can say it. It's better. <laughs> I believe it's better. Pisco is the only all natural spirit in the world by definition. What does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean? There's only one one ingredient in that entire bottle. Sex. <laughs> that's what you've we've found the way from, to bottle sex. That's Congrats. what we've created from that one ingredient. I, yeah. Yeah. Okay, no, what, so is it? You, what is it? So it's grapes. That's it. We take grapes. We ferment the grapes with no additives, no sulfites, only ambient yeast, no added yeast. Okay. So you ferment these grapes. You still have only grapes. You have a, a young wine is what you come up with, a young natural wine. We then distill that one time. The final result is a distillate from grapes that has no water added to it at the end. And that's what we bottle. Nothing ever even touched when we rinse our bottles with the head. So when you distill, the art of distillation is cutting at, at a, the beginning, which what you don't keep is called the head. And then at the end, what you don't keep is called the, the tail. We rinse our bottles with the head and the tail of the distillate because water can never touch the inside of our bottles. Interesting. But so when you look at other categories, and I'm, I'm not going to call them out here, but yeah. they, they say 100% something, that's not entirely true. Because first, it's been cut with water, which is okay. Like adding water is not, not a bad thing. But then there are, there's always caveats. Okay, it's 100%, but the law allows you to do 99%. You can do 1% of additives, and the law is still going to allow you to call it 100% because we want our category to grow. As a consumer, that's never felt right to me. At what point are people going to start caring about you have this product that, of course, in excess is going to be inherently not the best for you. Everybody knows that. Yeah. But when you know you're going to be consuming it moderately, why would you not put the best, the best thing inside your body? Why has that not really been? Why does the TTB, who's the FDA equivalent, not make you put ingredients on your labels? I think we know that, though. The TTB is the, probably one of like, it's, it's meant to keep little people out. It's meant to keep people like you out it's meant to make like if you're going to distill then you got to go large and you got to spend a bunch of money and so it keeps like any innovation out i mean i was dealing with ttb in houston texas and i was like this shit's crazy like the, the level of hoops and the level of like even a developer couldn't be associated with other alcoholic products even though they're not a function of the company at all but if you had opened a bar before uh sorry you're out you can't be part of it which means you can't get your license and it's like what are we doing like and all the rules all these hurdles are there on purpose there's a bunch of lobbying that's been on to protect the, you know, the people that have been there for hundreds of years. Exactly. And I get it. Like I get both sides of it, but yeah, I think that's why I mean, I'm TTB. convinced there's a better way and people, people are going to start caring about it more. That's like my, one of my operating principles. People are going to be looking at, I think you're right. What is on this label as we sort of progress here. It's, it's been happening in food for years. You're from the future. This is totally directionally correct. Like we all see this, right? This is what I'm excited. This is why I love you and your brand and this <laughs> shit. Cause I'm like a fan and I think it's a no brainer. And it's mission forward, but it's also like there's a real opportunity to, to dent this market and change people's perception. And I think as tequila gets oversaturated, it's a good thing. It plays right into your playbook, right? And so the thing that whiskey did that's different, which is actually interesting. So whiskey, what they do is like if they got you as, as an 18-year-old, then you would stay with them. So if you like Jack Daniels or whatever, like red label, let's call it, you would stay with them until, until you died. That's literally like this is how I've seen their decks. This is how it works. They have you until you die. And then what happens is like, once you become 30, or let's say 40, and you have a child, how do I get the 18 year old now? And they create a different brand. So they create, so same house, same company, but now it's like a different younger version of that. But it's the same thing because they know that consumer. Like, I'm not drinking my dad's stuff. I'm, I'm not drinking, drinking my, my dad's stuff. stuff. I'm drinking my own stuff. And so then they create another brand and then there's all these other brands and they do a little infusion of like, this one's got cherry or okay, cool. Okay. Interesting. But that's how they do it. And then as soon as, so their life cycle is the life cycle of their consumer. That's how they all operate. Tequila is not doing that. Tequila is going, everybody loves it. And we have three versions. We have the Hoven, but we're not really like changing the brand. All we're doing is adding celebrity today, which is something that Jack Daniels couldn't do or they didn't really care to do it. And so it's interesting. So I look at that as like, these are all great ingredients for people to start being like, uh, is tequila really it? Let's yeah. go somewhere else now. Yeah, It's getting mucky, which is great for you. And, and to that point, it's negative. Just to be clear, I, I love agave spirits. I mean, I really enjoy drinking Same. them. What you're referencing in the market has caused this, this oversaturation has actually negatively impacted the product because historically we're, we're maturing our agaves for seven to 10 years. We no longer have the ability to do that because the demand is so high. We're going to start maturing our agaves for only three to five years. What does that result in? You get a product that doesn't taste as good because it's not at the optimal 
point that 20, you know, 50 years ago they decided was the optimal point. Now they have to sort of move the goalposts to keep up with, with demand. So that's un- unfortunately something that's happened. And I hope that, that the industry in general can, can do a good job of making sure that they don't start putting all this bad or don't continue yeah. putting bad product out there to meet the demand. Well, if we can zoom out on this problem of education and, and influencing the marketplace. So it reminds me of what Thailand did um, a couple of decades ago. They, they knew that they needed to come up with a way to have diplomacy or, or have an, an impact on the world around them, even though they're a relatively small country. And so what they did was they went through and they started funding Thai restaurants all over the world, culinary diplomacy. And so that's why today there are Thai restaurants in just about every small town across the U.S. And it's not because all these Thai entrepreneurs like uh, are, are all f- operating successful Thai restaurants. It's because the government subsidizes them to make up for it. And I'm thinking like this is a potential uh, opportunity for the country of Peru, the government of Peru, to start engaging in some sort of diplomacy on a level that educates people about the products of Peru, like, you know, everything from the quinoa, the potatoes. I can't, I can't wait for this t- this hot take. Yeah. I Well, I think of... <laughs> Nick, the, you're so pure. I love it. The ability to, for, for the country of Peru Seems to like a start no-brainer, right? financing... Seems like a no-brainer. Some sort of marketing campaign around Pisco, around quinoa, around potatoes, whatever it might be. And, you know, you guys can lead the charge. Yeah. I think, Why aren't you doing that? I, I, think, <laughs> I think Diego understands a lot of the intricacies involved here. Spot on conceptually a hundred percent it's a great analog because not only have they done that uh the country of, we were talking about agave spirits just now the country of mexico has done a great job of investing in the infrastructure required within their country to get people to the producing regions but then also marketing within the u.s and other countries really but to, to help grow demand and creating a a platform for producers and brands to be successful peru has tried and we, we will continue to, so we have been speaking with both on the ground in Peru and then also at the different trade commissions, like Diego is, is uh, close with the trade commission here in, in LA. These exist in the major cities all around the country. You get limited mind share there because they're working with other categories too. It's not just Pisco. So we are trying to do a better job to make sure that they, they see the opportunity the same way that we do. And it seems like a no-brainer, but you'd, you'd be surprised when... So they're not convinced that this is worthwhile, is what you're saying? Uh, here's how I look at it. So I think, like, I'm going to go ahead and say it because I think it's important. I think culturally, Peru's cute. It's like, um, we're cute. We're just cute kids that do cute stuff. And no one's really understanding the value of, like, killing it. Mm-hmm. And I think culturally, this is, like, embedded in you as a child. And I hate it. I've never had it. I just go so hard the other way. I go, we're done being cute. And so when we, you talk to these trade, trade commissions or like the idea you're bringing up, it's the same. Mm-hmm. It's like intentionally this feels really good and emotionally it checks the boxes and they understand. But then there's never like, there's a cute follow through. We're there's, just happy there's to be not here a full swing Got it. follow through. Yeah. Got it. And it's a problem. And I think the other issue is I don't, there's a lack of sophistication in it. So, so Mexico has a trade commission that works really closely with America. And in that, they see how the Mexican GDP growth, so the Mexican products help America's GDP significantly. Mm -hmm. And then Mexico also says, and thank you because we get X, Y, Z. And so there's this like interesting known facts. The trouble that they're fighting though is like, why are you putting our people into the stereotype? Stop doing that, America. We literally power you. We're a, we're a, a meaningful part of your economy. And so there's a guy I met that worked under the Obama administration that was running like this whole group, the Trade Commission for Mexico, the Mexican-American relationship. And that's what he was saying. He's like, this isn't about us making you money. This is about like, just start, stop portraying us in these weird ways. Why are you doing that? Mm-hmm. Like we're a, we're a sophisticated economic army yeah, appropriate for you. Sense. Like yeah. stop doing that. And also like there's this notion that Mexican products aren't consumed in the middle, the middle of America. Turns out they are significantly mm-hmm. all over the middle of America where the stereotype you'd, you could argue is the worst. So I think Peru doesn't have that. They don't really value that. They're not really putting enough energy into, okay, there are tons of things that we could export. Let's have a sit down with the government. We're just not big enough. Like no one cares enough. And then the Peruvian government, for whatever reason, is just like they don't take a full swing. 
so I'm, I'm glad you, you bring this up. I'm going to use this as a launching point. <laughs> Do it. Go <laughs> um, hard, though. Go I, hard. I have some hot Go takes, hard. too, but I'm going to try to not let them all out. Oh, this is the problem. Is the problem. Um, let it out. This, so, this, you got to tell the country. So to your point, I mean, you're, you're spot on, right? What's the saying? Um, Gente pobre eh, sentados en un banco de oro. Like, it's, it's, it's a poor person seated on a, a gold bench. Mm -hmm. And that's what Peruvians we basically are because we have access to... the mind. They're poor in the mind. We have all of these amazing resources, yet we haven't commercialized what we have. Someone else has come and found it and commercialized it for us, exactly. which is, I think, what you're getting to. Yeah. So we need to show them the way, and they need, they need to be given like the exact playbook that it's going to work, and they need to be shown that it has worked a little bit, which just kind of creates a circular reference for you. Pisco's been around forever. Mm -hmm. So they look at the past 20 years as, oh, we've been trying to push Pisco Sours for the past 20 years, and it hasn't really worked, so why, do, why are you going to be different? Well, for starters, Pisco Sour isn't the best, in my opinion, Pisco cocktail out there. I think it's been hiding behind the Pisco Sour for far too long. I think that's one of our key issues. Oh, this would just fill my tank so much. <laughs> like literally, like the more I learn about your shit, it just like, it fills my tank because I'm like, there's just, un they're j all incompetent and someone has to solve this and the man's in the mirror. Like, yeah. that's how I look at it. And then when you get your award, you know, when you get your bread, when you get whatever it is that your success looks like, just be like, I want to thank all of you for thinking too small. Exactly. And I think it needs to be a new generation too. The heads of these respective trade commissions See, across the go. country are. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta launch this shit. You gotta blow it up. You have to. Yeah. So, so you we, have a job now. You have a responsibility to me. So, and this is part of what, I mean, impassioned me really to do this. So, so Diego gets this. I think, a Peruvian who was uh, what, what year? Uh, how old were you when you moved to the states? Like three. Okay. So, so same. I was, I was three. Exactly the same thing. So. I was brought into a society at a young age that is empowered to sort of think this type of way. And so you have this feeling of, it's not entitlement, it's empowerment, because I know I need to work my ass off to get it. Mm -hmm. But in Peru, oftentimes there's this mindset where, you know, Diego used the word cute. It's just like, well, you know, it just kind of is what it is. I'm not empowered to make it make a difference. So I've been having had this experience as a Peruvian American, I've kind of been obsessed with how can I create that experience for others who didn't have the privilege of, and it's not like the U S is the best place in the world. So people in Peru need to act that type of way. There's so much that Americans can learn from Peruvians as well. So how can we create a bridge between these two countries? What better way than what's a better way to connect with someone than sitting at a table, drinking something, whether it be coffee, right. could be a spirit, yeah. could be, iced tea it doesn't matter it gives you something to talk about and connect on a different level that we otherwise wouldn't have had we not had this so that's kind of what i've become obsessed with how can i create this connection how can we empower others to discover something new do something different and unfortunately not everyone gets that experience it's definitely been a challenge to try to get the trade trade commissions and peruvians to think differently yeah directly correct though good idea but uh, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, I get, forgot how we, yeah, 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 how we got there. <clears throat> no, it's a great idea. It makes perfect sense. I mean, even entrepreneurship. I mean, Latin American countries in general aren't really, in general, right? So around yeah. entrepreneurship, whether it's spirits or like tech, they're not they're not really fully embracing or understanding mm -hmm. the value of creating. So it's then hard to build a business business when you're also having to educate the yeah. culture. And then you look of, at it like yeah. this: like the, you can go the other way. So in Scandinavian countries, if you have a startup, they basically say, like the government says, okay, cool, your startup needs to be. So if you're a big company, let's say you're like one of the top 20 companies in Norway, let's mm -hmm. say. So if you're an entrepreneur, one of these top 20 companies has to give you a contract legally oh. in, in one or two in year one. And so that gives you like runway and a client. And then you have to work with them on the thing. And then hopefully it works. And then you can go take it to the mass market. Oh. That's a different kind of entrepreneurship, right? right? Because then it's like, I wouldn't even call it entrepreneurship. I'd call that you have a job. Mm -hmm. You gave yourself a job under the cloak of entrepreneurship. Cool. But if it works, then you can take it to the market. Right. And so that's, like, that's I think they went too wheels. far the other way. The beauty of entrepreneurship is you're supposed to go through hardship. The stressors make you. Mm -hmm. When you take those away, you, you cut yourself short. So that, there's also that, right? And mm -hmm. so I'm not suggesting any country has it right or wrong, but I would say in Peru generally, it's uh, in Latin American countries, it's not valued yet. Yeah. And, and to that point, right, we talked about Mexico. It's, it's a bordering state, the U.S. Yeah. They've seen the dollars. So yeah. when you see the dollars, it helps. There are geopolitical reasons here. So it's funny when when I was at when I talked to this guy 
who worked under the Obama administration, he, he, his point, his whole opening statement was around how most bordering countries have, have bad blood. And he was like, it's really nice having a friendly neighbor. And I was like, why is he saying that? <laughs> <laughs> that seems really like a weird thing to say. But I think in that he's trying to make the point of like, we're the ultimate ally and uh, geopolitical. It's a very geopolitical mm -hmm. statement to say, yeah. to start with that. Right. But that's what he started with. And I was like, oh, okay. I guess it could be worse. We could be at war. Right. right? But he's making the point of is we, we basically have a percentage of your GDP and we could go to war, but we, we won't, but we could and you'd be screwed. Mm -hmm. So thank you. It's America. Like like pay, it was like threat. pay attention. It, yeah. it really was. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I want to ask another potentially really dumb question no such about thing. Peru. There's the, there's so, no so <laughs> we'll tell you, Nick, we'll tell you. So uh, I, I, the other thing I think Nick's about cute. is he's with, cute because uh, he's just so nice, so well-intentioned. Yeah. The, well, <laughs> going back to what you said about uh, Chile and how they make uh, Pisco, mm -hmm. but it is not the same as Peruvian Pisco because they uh, distill it or, or dilute careful, it. Careful. How so, much time do we have? Because we can, we can dig into this. Yeah. One. Well, you know, we, we can take as much time on this This is the YouTube you clip want, Owen is dying for. Yeah. So let's just make it go. Let's just do and, it. No, and also, yeah. just, how long do you okay. typically video for? I want to figure out how to. Oh, we have until yeah. 4 p.m. <laughs> yeah. But, no, no, like, hot, all right, just hot take. So would it make sense in a perfect <laughs> world, knowing now what I know about like the Peruvian government and culture, would it ever make sense for them to institute a sort of label similar to the Champagne region of France where you cannot call it Pisco if it is made outside of this region? You're not in smart Peru. enough, Nick. It exists. Okay. This is a long, long standing. Right? If you want to really take it far back, the origin of this animosity between the two countries comes from the war of the Pacific okay. in the 1800s. So Chile was at war with our neighbors and allies, Bolivia, who at the time was had a coast, a Southern border, a oh. Southern border that, so it coasted, it was between basically Bolivia split Peru from Chile. So Peru was not bordering Chile at the time. Chile went to war with Bolivia as Bolivia's ally, Peru had to step in and help the combo of Peru and Bolivia lost that war. And one of the byproducts of that war was Bolivia losing their coastline and becoming completely landlocked. Bolivians, of course, have animosity towards the Chileans for that, but also Peruvians do too. So having lost that, it just always kind of had this, this bad blood and kind of weird dynamics when any two nations go to war together. But then to add insult to injury, we had this product that we felt that we introduced to the world, really. We were calling it Pisco because we literally have a port called Pisco, Chile started, so Chile has really good wine. Like no one's going to take that away from them. They have exceptional wines in Chile. Good mm -hmm. Carmenier is like, you, you can't. Yeah. They have really good wines. They started distilling their wine, double, triple distilling it, completely different methods, different grapes to begin with because they have different, um, you know, different climate. So they just different grapes to begin with. And most of them are from the Alexandria Muscat family, which is what this is actually is. But other than that, there's really very small crossover between the the grapes in chile versus the grapes in peru but so chile started distilling it and making it calling it pisco mm -hmm. and like why the name pisco why did you choose that so they started thinking about it well why don't we rename this town where we're, most of the production is happening which was called la union at the time the union in the 40s they renamed that town to pisco so that they felt like they could create this denomination of origin so that we can now call our product Pisco right. because we now have a town called Pisco also. So as Peruvians, you just kind of look at it and like, why are you doing this, you know? So I think that just made, made things worse. Each country has gone and sought out their, their own denominations of origin. The uh, Peru's was granted in 1991 and the U.S. recognizes it. However, they also recognize the Chilean one. So if you walk into a liquor store down the street, you'll see a Peruvian Pisco and a Chilean Pisco. TTB just requires you to say Pisco de Peru or Pisco de Chile or, you know, Peruvian Pisco or Peruvian Chile. As long as you distinguish between one of those two, you're okay. But you take that, there are other countries. There's something like 80 countries in the world that exclusively recognize the Peru denomination of origin. So Chilean Pisco can't make it in. If okay. it gets in, they have to call it something different. Okay. On the flip side, there are also, I'm using round numbers here, I think it's like 30 to 40 countries that only recognize the Chilean Pisco. So both of these countries are constantly fighting and, and 
countries all around the world to make sure that their product is being recognized. It's not like, you know, cognac or tequila, like no other country swooped in and tried to do the exact same thing. So, you know, I don't know how Peru could have fought that off at the beginning. I'm sure there's something they could have done to do better, but now it's kind of like we are where we are. Mm -hmm. So as I was saying at the beginning, rather than trying to bicker over who makes it, what let's educate about the differences, super high level. What are the differences? Completely different grapes, like different grape classes. So that's the starting point. Mm -hmm. Secondly, Chilean Pisco can be double, triple, quadruple distilled. The more you distill something, the more it essentially becomes vodka. Yeah. Okay, Peruvian Pisco is only single distilled by law. Chilean Pisco can be aged. Peruvian Pisco cannot be aged. So Peru, Peruvian Pisco is always going to be clear. You're never going to see a dark colored Peruvian okay. Pisco. Chilean Pisco, if you see a dark, it means it's been aged in some sort of barrel for a long leave. period of time. It leave. Yeah. In the key distinction to make is aged versus rested because Peruvian Pisco by law has to be rested at least three months. We rested ours for a year. Okay. And the distinction is that rested means it's in neutral, uh, it's, neutral containers. Right. It's not going to be like uh, absorbing any flavors like exactly. being in an oak barrel or something like that. Exactly. So it can be glass, can be copper, can be stainless steel, can be polyethylene, which is plastic. As you said, you can't do it in a barrel. Okay. Um, and those are really the, the, the key differences. So you can end up with a completely different product at the end of the day, and yet they're both still called Pisco, and it's just kind of confusing, I think, to the consumer. So what we, I think, need to focus on is educating about the differences between the two rather than the more we fight each other, the less, and this is kind of a, a, a problem that's endemic to, I think, Peruvians in general. We're always like f- chopping each other's legs off rather than building each other up. So it's like the scarcity mindset that's mm-hmm. so big and prevalent. Yeah, like if, if my neighbor's doing well, it means I'm not doing well. But part of what, you know, there are a lot of things that motivate me to do this, obviously. <laughs> it's just like, but this having, is why I want you to win so bad. Having, having had, I'm like your biggest cheerleader. <laughs> Always. I appreciate that. That's why I'm appreciate like, you got to sell your shit for 90 bucks. We got to go $90 Pisco. We got to, we got to be that thing. I got to be the P Diddy for you. I got to have, I got to open up all these clubs and man. restaurants. So that way, when I throw parties with all these celebrities, it's just the only thing there is Pisco. Oh, you want vodka doesn't exist. You want tequila doesn't exist. We just have Pisco bottles. We just take photos of everybody. All this goes on your socials. It's, it's the new wave. That's how I look at it. And so we got to get the culture. We got to get the music. We got to get the tattooing. We got to get culture. Exactly. And it's then you win. Culture. Culture. All right. Is there someone on Instagram that's like the Pisco King or Pisco Queen? Is there someone on there that, that like really owns that that niche? I'm just curious. No. There are because I'm you see, know see this is the, this is what I'm always thinking about it's like there's got to be so in order to win you have there has to be people in your circle or outside tertiary that are like already experts and they can't be the local bartender which already exists we already, already those people are there's a few of them in New York hmm. Lynette is one of them yeah yeah remember Lynette oh yes yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. the master class so bartender who's been a yeah. you know tremendous ally for the category not even a Peruvian but okay. a Latina who yeah. has uh, you know spent many years in a Nikkei concept restaurant and ran that program and obviously was on master class and she's Legend. done an amazing she's job awesome. Legend. Mm-hmm. how do you how do you view growth for the next year or two what do you what are you doing what are we doing what's the expectation no I have high expectations <laughs> it's not the expectation <laughs> what, what, are you, what are you doing like how do you view it you and Ian raising capital wise yeah. you know just just the whole thing the entrepreneurship journey of like Ultimately, you have a product, you're trying to get it to market, you want it to scale, you want it to do well. What is on your horizon for, for blowing this up? Or just getting it, just getting into the market? We're very much, very much at an inflection point. I would say we were relatively methodical in the way that we approach bootstrapping this business. But I caveat that with the fact that we both come from different industries. So what do you guys come from? What are the industries? Humbly had no idea what we were doing in this category. Yeah, which is the best, by the way. Yeah, it's kind of like you, it you, is the best. you start doing it and you're like, why in the world does that exactly. restriction exist? Right. That doesn't make any sense, but there's a lot of lobbying dollars that are keeping it that way. So there's only so much you can do, but we have to still change something. Yeah. So I came from a, I spent about six years working in investment banking, and then I spent about three years working in corporate development, which is like, you know, corporate strategy, internal M&A. And what is Ian? What is Ian's background? Uh, consulting. So both of us, okay. we, we both worked at the same uh, healthcare services company. He was working in consulting and I was working in corporate development and <laughs> I joined the firm. And uh, so while it was the global headquarters, it was pretty small because the, the company is all over the world. And uh, it's about 50 people in the office, maybe a little bit more. And we both found out that there was another Peruvian in the office. So 
you may appreciate this. Like we both kind of had this <laughs> vision of what the other guy was supposed to look like. So like when I meet this person, like I'm going to know that it's him. <laughs> we must have passed each other in the hallway a dozen times over the course of the next several And his weeks. name is Ian. So of course, yeah, there's no neither one of us have particularly Peruvian names either, right. at all. Yeah. So we were, you know, we're at a work function That's about two or three months into my having joined and uh, we finally met each other and we were both like, all right. You're that guy? Oh. You're the Peruvian? Yeah. And then, you know, of course, from there, we just always remained close because mm-hmm. uh, I think there was just kind of that natural yeah, connection of course. that there was existed. A kinship there. Right, but how do you scale it? How do we scale it? Yeah. So you're in the world now. You realize the game's a little different than you originally thought. What do you do? What are you doing? Yeah. So is it more capital intensive? Is that the thing that you recognized? Or what, what's like the, what was the thing? So quick context on how we got here, because it may be helpful. We were methodical in that we wanted to bootstrap this thing because we have so much to learn. And the lifeblood of our business is our producers. We don't want to just go private label a product and stamp our name on it. That lacked sure. what we wanted. That lacked our yeah. you know, DNA. And so we spent a lot of time creating and then fostering these relationships with our producers. And mostly Ian, because he lives there and he's in this every single day. That took a long time and it continues to be, you know, it's a lot of work and we do this all the time. The pandemic happened. We started fighting two different battles. So we technically hadn't launched yet, but we were about ready to do so. Now I'm talking to distributors and the cell is not only, there's, there's two pieces that there are friction points. One, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're gonna stick to our money makers. So we're not taking on new brands to begin with. We are only gonna sell Tito's and we're gonna sell Casamigos because we know we're gonna make money off of these. We're gonna be very risk averse. Okay, fine. Also, you're in a category that people haven't even heard of. Why are we going to take that big of a risk in the middle of a pandemic? And this mindset really existed for, continues to exist to a lesser degree t- today. So that approach, I think, has been helpful for us where we were kind of learning the nuances of the market and we were able to build these relationships the way that we wanted rather than raising capital right away and having to meet the timeline of, you know, a timeline that's basically been impre- impressed upon us. We can sort of do things our own way. Mm-hmm. We are now at a point where we've been in the market less than a year, but where people are starting to know who we are and to get to the next level, it's kind of, what do you do? We need to expand our distribution footprint, but arguably more importantly, expand consumption with the, within the existing distribution footprint. That's what keeps me up at night. How can I get more people to learn about Suyo? It's, it's still just myself in the U.S. market. Ian, of course, is, is involved as well, but he's sort of geographically restricted with where he is. Is it bringing on more sales reps? I don't want just 22-year-olds running around saying, buy Suyo. That, that, that lacks the character that we, we think we need. But how can we get more people learning? Social media is a great, you know, we started working with, with, with Lexi and her team. Like, that's a great starting point. Yeah, a friend connected me and it ended up working out well. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so the next phase is really growing awareness. How can we get, how can we amplify our voices? How can I get that microphone that right now I spend 90% of my time running around New York City talking to bars and restaurants and we've, we've gotten a lot of really good traction, but I can't clone myself 50 times to go around the rest of the country and do the same thing. So this is not a problem that's you know, exclusive to us, but I think it is somewhat unique to a a brand new category. Yeah. We're admittedly very much trying to figure that out, but it's going to require, it's going to require a different level of thinking here in the upcoming months, uh, upcoming months that, um, you know, not now that we kind of have the production relatively figured out, I say it's relative because I don't want to undersell how difficult it is to do business in Peru. And with that being kind of the lifeblood of what we do, we have, we've invested a lot of dollars and a lot of time in that. Now that we have that to a place where we feel like we can succeed and we can scale, now it's time to really start, really, really start making a dent in the American market. And, you know, we have a lot of ideas, but haven't really invested dollar-wise heavily in any of those yet. I think that's that's the next phase. Do you think it's meeting, so do you think that it's, distrib- it's basically focusing on the distributors and their teams, or do you think it's more of like, getting in with the restaurant groups what yields more right so so everything we talk about in this room is always yield it's always like i could do x and that would take me an hour and what's the yield or i could do x and that would take me two hours but the yield is 20 times and so what what has been like the high yield event for you the obvious answer for me is this is on a relatively low scale but i'm mostly answering your question and then i'll fully answer it 
when I'm doing a tasting. For anyone though, or for like, like. Put me in a liquor store. I yeah. go to a liquor store invite me to come do tastings. Yeah. You'll do it? I do them all the time. We're going to do it today. What are you doing today? It's what are you the doing best later? way to. Uh, what are you doing later? Well, so you have to, typically the liquor store has to already Forget that. Product. What are you doing later? All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go, we're going to go at 6 p.m. You guys are all going to go to the tennis club. There's 16 people playing tennis. We all go up for a drink after. Hmm. You're going to do the thing. The guy who owns the LA Times is one of the people in that room. Oh, no way. Yeah. Same. There's a Chandler family. Okay. Everyone in that room is a player on the magnitude of like, they own restaurant groups. They own all this stuff. Hmm. And so these are the right people. These are the right. people that are going to be like, oh, we love it. And I'm just going to, I'm the guy, because as you know, that's going to be like, invest today at Possibly the end of this. you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be like, I want to be like Diddy to you. I want to be the ambassador. <laughs> I want to be the guy that's like blowing this up. And I want you to be like, we don't like him. I want you as Suyo to be like, we don't understand why this guy is so crazy. He's just, <laughs> he's just like so hype about our product and like, but they're different, you know, like he's just, yeah. he's a, he, he's a different human. Cause I think that works also. The yield when, so, when someone comes up to me and actually talks to me. So a lot of times you get people who are in a rush, right? Like buying, coming into the store to buy something and like, I got to go, sorry, I don't have time to taste, which is rare. Most, most of the time people do want to taste something, but they don't have time to talk. When I get a chance to talk to them, to them, it's like, you see the light bulbs. Why haven't I been drinking this? How, how come no one's told me about this before? Like, did you just make this up? This is confusing to me. So I got to buy a bottle now. How can I recreate that same experience? Obviously, I can't. I can't go everywhere and be everywhere at once. But to your point at the club, when I sit at the bar and I pull out the, the bottles and the bartender's tasting them, people see and they see a, a Capitan, which is my favorite cocktail, a Pisco Sour maybe. You know, they're like, I, I, need to, I need to have that. Why haven't I had that before? I really need to have that now. How can I create that same level of connection? How can I scale that level of connection? It's very challenging. All right, let's think about that. So let's, 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 what are your ideas? How do you scale it? Cause so, I have, I have ideas. Yeah. So I'd love to do, <laughs> okay. One of them is, is kind of like, it's not going to be an absolute grand slam overnight, but I believe still what I believe is right is not necessarily right. So please pressure test this. These sort of like micro events across the country they're expensive this expensive. is part of the problem so how do you partner yield. with yield isn't there how do you partner with restaurants who can maybe give you the space for free Low and you yield. bring in Low people yield. who are influential in the category in that particular city and will say oh i'm gonna go tell my bartender you know head of the beverage program here to go get this i'm gonna go tell my restaurant owner friends to go get this i'm gonna go tell my celebrity friends about this and then it sort of word of mouth grows that way but i can do a, a proper t- tasting with them so they can see the nuances between the two educate them about the product, maybe bring in some ceviche, alfajores, which I think, you know, it's, it's a Peruvian dessert, pairs perfectly with our Italia, if you want to enjoy it sort of like as a digestif. So if we can give them that experience, it propels you, I think, to go tell more people about it. And if we target the right people, if we do one of these in every single major city of America, that's that can be impactful. That doesn't give you the megaphone that overnight creates all this demand for you, but that's kind of what we're working on now. We did something like that in New York a few months ago, but to your point, it was expensive. We had to rent out the space, and when we look back on it, it was like, yeah, it doesn't pencil. The the ROI on that was very very small. That's low yield. I mean, that's a lot of work. Low yield. It's hard. It's it's very hard, <laughs> especially when you're you have uh, restrictions with the way you can do things within this space. What does that do? What does that, what does that mean? Okay. So I can't go into a bar in Texas right now and just start pouring my Pisco because I don't have right. distribution there, which means I don't have a license right yeah, now. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I can't, that's Texas. I can't sell e-commerce <laughs> everywhere. So I can't, I live in Massachusetts. I can't even sell my product in Massachusetts. You can't wow. order it from my website to send it to Massachusetts, but that's mm. an excuse, right? Like I, I'm not going to make an excuse. I'm glad you see it that way. You need to <laughs> you need to be impactful where you are with with what you have. Yeah. So brand ambassadors, as Lexi was mentioning, I, I hate that term. Sorry. Uh, I've started creating. Who are they though? Who are they? So so far, it's just been friends and friends of friends. But I've been calling them friends of. But what studio. do they do? What do they do? They like what does an ambassador do? I can tell you what they're supposed to do. What are they supposed to do? But not what they what they have been doing. Low yield again. We're in the low yield ch- chat. So and, and this is <laughs> where I think external feedback is like really really helpful. I'm because, here for you because mm-hmm. you know I'm the type of person. Ian, and my business partner, is the type of person who we love. This is a, very much a passion project for us that has turned into something that is real, and we love growing organically. We don't we don't love certain things, you know, like there are certain things that don't, I think, fit our ethos and throwing marketing dollars at clubs and stuff like this. It just doesn't really fit well with us. 
So getting brand ambassadors who don't fit our ethos obviously doesn't really work well for us. But what does it look like, the brand ambassador program? What is it? What is it? Yes, yeah, so we're calling them Friends of Suyo, and they're people who live in the cities, major cities and states in which we dis- distribute. And these are people who are or are not in the category, primarily not, who have medium to high income earners who spend a lot of time out at bars and liquor stores and are, are relatively influential amongst their peer group incentivizing them to look i'm going out and hanging out at a bar restaurant thursday friday saturday anyway i might as well now talk to the bartender about this really cool product that i have and tell them what's different about it and then any time that it sells i'm giving them a commission that's in perpetuity it's not just one time but do they sell it or how does that work so we just started doing it it's been or do you give them a free bottle and then something happens with that yeah give them one of these and then a bunch of these little guys yeah so that they can sort of distribute them themselves but uh, but yeah. even in that setting, the, the way the operation would go is, hey, do you like it? Cool. Try it. Okay. And then they have to get in touch with the distributor, right? Correct. Yeah. So there's a lot of friction points. Yeah. Potential friction it's points. It's like LATC when I'm like, hey, get it in here. And you're like, who's your distributor? And I'm like, not my job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how it is, right? That's, that's yeah. how I look at it. And so I just look at it as like, because here's how it worked. I go, Jeff, who's your distributor? Oh, I don't know. You got to talk to Brian. Who's Brian? Head of FNB. I'm out. Died on the vine. Yeah. And I know Brian, and I could text Brian, but I'm like, why? Why? Why is it? Why is it that? Why is it 14 steps? It's too. It's too difficult. This is the story of my life. That's what I'm saying. And so we have to. So so if we can, if we can, if we're smart enough to accept friction and understand it, then we're smart enough to solve it. So how do we get around it? If we could get some law changes, I think that would be really helpful too. But obviously, that's not something that happens. Yeah, no. Overnight. Low yield again. But you ultimately want to be in like you want to be in locations, right? That's your yes. play. Yes. Obviously, you've made but you've not made just that be in bed. locations. Have it move within locations for sure. But you, there's. You've made the bed in terms of like dist- distribution becomes your avenue. That's it. And so distribu- well, it's, it's the only it's the only avenue right now. Great. And so that's it. Makes it simpler. And so then it's like, okay, cool. So now you have to get into these places and how do you do that? That's that's the game. Exactly. And so the ambassador program is some of it, but where that drops off is they still have to contact the distributor, which means bartender must know distributor. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, but that's challenge one. Correct. And, okay. and then not only do they need to, they now need to fill out paperwork to work with that distributor. Right. If they don't already. But if I own, let's say I own seven restaurants, simpler, right? If you're talking to the owner. No. Not to get the product. It's no, simpler it, for me because you're it's now simpler in more the, the decision, the decision to put you in seven versus this one is simpler. Because then I just go, here, talk to my head of whoever yeah. that person, right? Is that not simpler? It's, it's so unfortunately, it doesn't work that way in my experience so far. These Why? restaurant groups like to empower their beverage managers at each location. Yeah. So. But you meet with them then, yeah? At, at each individual one, correct. But they, yeah. they basically silo the decision making. It's 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 ridiculous. Yeah. Um, it, it's not ideal for, for a brand owner. Yeah. But right now, I mean, you typically don't see someone saying, I've only seen it once where they said, yeah, you know what, I'll, I'll right now put, put you in all three of my locations. Because typically they, they want to make sure that each restaurant or bar serves as, as its own decision maker. The caveats to that are kind of, but not entirely, something like a, a Total Wine, where they can put you in many of their stores overnight. But they decide which stores you're going into. We just got approval this week to go into Total Wine in California. But it was specific locations. It wasn't all of the locations. It was about a dozen locations. Because they're the ones that they decided were going to be the best for us. Is it a trial period? Like, whereas if you, over a certain amount of months, you move a certain amount of product, then they move you into more stores and more stores? Yes. Okay. So it's not defined to you that way, but undoubtedly that's okay. So let's let's do this. Let me just let's, let's debunk this. So if I'm the head of FNB, why am I buying? What is ultimately the thing? Is it? And I'm just gonna give you a scenario so you can. Yeah. Is it? Is it that I saw Drake with a picture of it? Is it that I saw you in the LA Times uh, and you got you personally and Ian got featured mm-hmm. on the Pisco? Is it purely none of that matters? We're just gonna go off taste and what I think I can sell it for or how I can sell it. What yeah. are the things? So there's kind of like two lines of thinking right now that I see with these these beverage managers and you know, like the, the bartenders who are running these programs. One of them is the obvious. We've had so much demand for this product. We need to get it. Like, that's obvious. Makes People sense. People are coming and asking for it, and I need to get it. Yeah. That's not happening yet. Yeah. So right now, the other is, I don't know if scarcity is the right word. It's the uniqueness. It's the novelty of, wait a minute, like, I can do something really cool with this product, and I'm going to be the only bar in the area making it. I need to get this product. Those are the bars. So part of why I'm focusing on high-end mixology bars right now yeah. so it's like you know high-end Peruvian Nikkei fusion restaurants that's obvious but then it's high-end mixology bars yeah they're the feeder yeah they see like oh there's so much opportunity with this this is like a really I can sell this I can talk to patrons about this and I can tell a cool story about not only the product but also the brand 
those are kind of like the two, the obvious decision or the not so obvious decision, but it requires a certain level of creativity and outside the box thinking that not everybody has, unfortunately. So if I'm going to make this one work, I need to reach the end consumer. I need to build up a demand for this product so that it becomes an obvious decision for said beverage manager, bartender, whomever. How do I do that? So there's like the the hand-to-hand combat approach, which, which I'll refer to it as. Brands have done this. The playbook does exist. But to your point, I think it's, it's, it's capital intense, intensive. They're just befriending the bartenders. You're creating a community of bartenders who love you. So bartenders, who, who's your best salesperson, arguably? It's, it's a bartender. You're, you're sitting down, and this is sort of flipped on its head during COVID, but now it's, it's coming back. You're sitting at a bar. You see something on the cocktail menu you've never even heard of before. Well, what, the, what the heck is this? The bartender is now selling you on why you should get that. You are now, you got to experience this product at an approachable price point. I, I'm now more likely to go spend $50 on a bottle of Suyo in a liquor store. Otherwise, if I just saw this, be like, Bisco, I've never heard of this. I'm not going to spend $50 on this. I'd rather spend $15 on a cocktail so I can try it first. So bartenders are, are really, so far in my experience, have been your, your best selling point. So how do you educate them, but also incentivize them? And incentivize is, is the key that's difficult because you can't give them monetary incentives. That's like literally illegal. So make them like you, give them swag. What you see with the big budget companies is take them on trips to Oaxaca, take them on trips to champagne, like whatever category you're in. So how can we be, you know, scrappy is a weird word. I don't know if I love that word, but like, how can we think outside the box? Because we don't have the ability to do these things that other brands are doing. So how can we organically build this community? I mentioned the the friends of Suyo slash brand ambassadors, befriending these, these bartenders and these bar owners make them understand what you are, what you're doing and like you, and then build it up that way. Because I found that if you're focusing on distributor, as I think we to sort of bring it full circle, we were talking about at the beginning to sell your distributors on it. Like that can only take you so far unless you're pumping big dollars into doing these big events and taking them on trips and whatnot. Are distributors really going to go to bat for you if you're not incentivizing them to do so? You need to make their decision so obvious. People are asking, people are clamoring for your product. Yeah. So I need to take you on now. Mm-hmm. That's that's what we're doing right now. We need to get people clamoring for our product and we're not there yet. I look at it like this, right? Like the Friends of Suyo program, I would let's 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 argue it's your highest yield, but it's it's still I would say medium yield, right? It's, so it's also hard and it's slow and you're dependent on yeah. a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It's like it's like being a stand-up comedian and you can only practice 3 days a week. Yeah, and I'll tell you full transparency, that has not been my, high, my highest yeah. yield, undoubtedly, highest yield? Yeah. has been me going to tastings and selling, oh, okay. you know, six to ten bottles per, per tasting. That's been by far our highest yield, not the, not the Friends of Suyo program. The branding angle, I mean, is the whole thing, like you said, right? You want people to ultimately, you got to build the brand. That's the hard part. That's like the hardest part. Hmm. Like, if you want to talk about slow game, podcasting is the hardest fucking thing. In terms of like you, you like you literally have to grow the brand, and there's two avenues to do that. You can either do word of mouth, or I can pump like two million dollars into getting this everywhere, so you can't you can't not see me. And mm-hmm. there's these two interesting games, mm-hmm. but what I've learned is I get to play both of them. That's kind of the like, the annoying truth, and you have to do them in a way that one gets you paid, right? So that's problem one. How do I get paid? How does how do you put food on the table or just feed yourself? And then two. It's like, how do I sell the vision to people that are crazy enough that view the world the way I do? And what I've learned in that process is you start, you start to go crazy yourself, like me. You start to just go full ham. Like you Have start you gone to, crazy already? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Like, I think when you meet me, like, I am unapologetically so driven to, to say my piece or to give you my opinion or to be like, let's make it. Let's make it. Because what's holding you back is really usually just mental. It's usually just your ability to see yourself. It's like, am I really that guy? That's what's actually, that's the hard part of entrepreneurship is just like you're saying, like the brand is an extension of me and Ian. Mm. So is everything that holds you back. That's the fucked up part. And so what that means is once you've made your decision, I say this all the time for like, have you made your decision for Christ? Right. It's like the, the, the thing in the, for, for Christ. Is that- <laughs> well, the, it's like the decision. It's like the, the, uh, have you seen that, that, that little bit where it's like, put that coffee down, like, like coffees for closers. Oh, so in yeah. that, in that the Glenn 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 Ross. Ross. Yeah. yeah. So in that yeah. little monologue, he's like, have you made your decision for Christ? That's what he says in that monologue. And so that's why I repeat it like that. But it's basically like, have you become convinced yourself? And I think that's the hardest part of entrepreneurship 
It has the founder because everything is obviously an extension of you. Hmm. And it's so interesting, right? When you start your brand, you're like, I saw this problem in the market and then I wanted to solve it. And so that's you being you, right? That's you saying, I saw this, it's my problem. Now I'm solving it and it's my solution. Cool. Except, except all the flaws that come with that. It, they're yours. Except your inability to think big. It's yours. Except your inability to think and lean so heavily unapologetically into the mission. That's yours. That's the thing with entrepreneurship. That's mm -hmm. the thing I like about this podcast is because you could have a super successful company, but we see it all the time where people aren't leaning in. So what does leaning in look it's, like? That's many the thing. different takes on many different forms. It depends. It's like um, some people want to be cute. Some people want to be nice. You know, I think some people, you could be number one in the category. Let's say you were number one in the liquor category, but you didn't want to upset the tequila companies. And so you play nice. How do you do that? Why do, why do you do that? What are you really solving for? And so it's this thing of like, even when you have success, you can still be playing safe for reasons I don't know. Mm. You know, it's like, it, that's why I love this game because mm. to me, it's less about business or success. It's more about how committed are you willing to really be? And that means accepting your fears, driving through them. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. That's why I love this, this, this whole process. Yeah. That's why I love people's journeys too, because it's like, I see it. So what I like about it is usually there's like, a set of ideas and about around like making money. There's sets of doors and windows and you look at them and you're like, oh, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this. And then you're kind of like, no, you can't actually. Like those don't make any sense. If they're low yield, close them. They have no value to you, hmm. but you're just making yourself feel better. And so then the, like the solutions become, this is the only path or these two options are the only path. That's poetic in nature, but I think you get it. Yeah, and you bring up an interesting point because you could, as you said, go head to head with, with tequila and make that gamble, if you will, where now you potentially create enemies who are trying to box you out of distribution or geographic footprint or whatever. And like, th that doesn't feel like the right approach because I love what a lot of these brands are doing and I don't want to upset that category. And then, you know, more so with it, our brand was built on collaboration, like literally in its DNA at its core, it's what we are doing is collaborating with other producers and trying to grow the category together because the, the rising tide raises all ships. Like that's, that's why we exist. So like historically you've had these Peruvian producers and brands who, as I said, like are kind of chopping each other's legs off because they think, you know, there's 0.01% of market share that we have in the U S right now for Pisco sours. We're fighting for that 0.01%. Like what? This is crazy. The pie is massive. Why don't we work together and get 10% market share yeah. by doing things differently? And they haven't really still figured that. They haven't figured that out yet. So what we do is like literally every single day, we're talking to other Pisco brands about how can we work, work together to grow? And to them, it's kind of like, wait, what? Why would we do that? And that's the right attitude. That's the right play. But it's also like, I would even take it a step further. Talk to a tequila brand about how you can work together. They've done this. You know what I'm saying? That roadmap exists. Like they have literally done this. That's the ultimate. It's like, you've already done it. Take me on, little brother. Help me out. Show me the path. Well, listen, tell everyone where they can find you. Where, they can, where can they buy, support? You can find us at, uh, on Instagram at Suyo Pisco, uh, S-U-Y-O-P-I-S-C-O. You can find us online. You can purchase Suyo on our website. We cannot ship to all states, but most states we can ship to. And we are currently distributing in, in eight different states, which are... New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Kentucky, California. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll grow that network with... Uh, it's coming. Yeah. We're doing yeah. it. All Thanks, 50 states soon. Thanks for coming on the show, Alex. Thanks for having so, me on, guys. If you made it this far, I bet you loved the episode. So you should join our YouTube channel membership for only $2.99 a month. This gets you access to one, the whole unabridged conversation. Two, you get the episodes on Monday, one day earlier. Three, you get two additional entries to our giveaways. Check out our Instagram to see what we've given away. And four, you get access to seasons one through three. That's over a hundred episodes of wisdom and life-changing advice. What are you waiting for? Join.